So, welcome to session eight, which continues the ideas of Marx. And the uh, key topics we'll cover in this session are as follows bourgeoisie and proletariat, substructure and superstructure, capitalism, socialism, and communism. Now, these are just a continuation from uh, the previous section. Now, you recall that sociology emerged in the 19th century. But one of the main factors driving the change in society, which actually excited sociologists to start thinking about a new discipline, is the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. Now, this contrasts sharply with the feudal society uh, that Europeans lived in, where there were laws, the clergy, the monarchy, who were enjoying in society. The Industrial Revolution that occurred actually replaced feudal society, or was replacing feudal society. So industries were springing up in Europe for the first time in human history. So we had some few people who were developing the industries. So they were the owners of industry. And so a lot of the people were laborers, which were earners as we see them today. So Marx's idea is that social classes were emerging, but two major classes were now occupying the center. The newly rich the owners of industry, banks, shops, etc., must refer to them as the bourgeoisie. And those who did not own any means of production or property, but were forced to sell their labor power, were called the proletariat. So in simple terms, it's like rich versus the poor. Now, Marx reasoned that there was some contradiction between these two people. Just like we say there was contradiction between thesis and antithesis. So between those who have and those who do not have. So one class, that is the bourgeoisie, was exploiting the proletariat. They were exploiting them because they drove them into factories, paid them pittance, very little amounts of money, and so some of them were not even able to subsist very well. So they were driven by industry because the bourgeoisie wanted to make so much money and the proletariat were exploited. So Marx felt that there was tension, there was conflict, and there was contradiction in society. So Marx's reasoning was that anytime there is tension, there's contradiction, just like the thesis and antithesis there's going to be a synthesis. In the case of the material world where people enter into production of goods and services, if there's contradiction, must believe that doc, that contradiction will be ironed out or be resolved and a new material production system will be set up. So Marx envisaged the idea that capitalism, because it breeds contradictions and conflict, will be replaced by another system, which we call socialism. And finally, there will be communism. Now, Marx divided society into these two basic parts, the substructure and the superstructure. So for Marxist sociologists, uh, we think in terms of society as having substructure and superstructure. Now, the substructure is basically that economic institution of society, the, the institution in which we engage in material production for sustaining our lives. So when we uh, produce things in the economy, that is where we get our food, we get our shelter, our clothing, and all that. So come back to the idea that Marx says we must eat first before we think. So eating is more important than thinking at this level. Now, the, in the superstructure, is where we do the thinking. We do the ideas. And then these include the religious institution, the educational institution, the family, politics, and other belief systems that we have. And in modern times, we can say media, law, and all that. So apart from the economic institution, all others belong 
to the superstructure. Now, the superstructure is where ideas are created. You know, in religion, it's ideas. Education, ideas. Politics, ideas. But it is only the economics institution that it is about producing material things, food, shelter, and all that, trading, and all that. So the distinction from the Marxist perspective, perspective is clear. Now, the superstructure, according to Marx, is full of ideas, or the ideas that are created there are used to legitimize the substructure. So that if the substructure is exploitative, let's say capitalist system of production is exploiting the workers. Because there's a contradiction there, there's conflict there, the superstructure, uh, the superstructural ideas will be constructed in such a way that they legitimize the substructure. In other words, they give validity or legitimacy to the substructure, the economic institution. For example, in Ghana today, we are operating in something like capitalist society even though government may come in to do a few things, but fundamentally it's a capitalist society. So in a capitalist society, we leave the system of production in the hands of individuals. So in, the, in the extreme form, government is even not supposed to do anything. People should do everything. So what it means is that government will only set up the rules of engagement. What, how shall we resolve conflict? Rule of law, and then there's, there's conflict between uh, producers, they can go to court and settle it. Government will not do so much. That is an, an extreme capitalist society. And you, that is why in Ghana today you can understand why government, government upon government have been saying that today it is property owning democracy. Private sector is the engine of growth. All these statements allude to the fact that we want to practice capitalism. This contrasts sharply with those of you who probably know the economic history of Ghana during Nkrumah period. Nkrumah wanted to use the state to be in control of everything. The state will set up industry, the state will run schools and all that. So Nkrumah was gearing the system towards socialism where the state comes in forcefully to set priorities and all that. But we have abandoned that. So in extreme socialist society, private property is abolished. Everybody is an employee of the state. So if Ghana, for example, were operating a socialist society, nobody would set up school. Nobody would set up factory. Nobody would say, I'm owning a bank. No the state is in control. So capitalism and socialism, they are two contrasting productive systems or economic systems. Now, the time Marx was alive and writing, it was capitalism that was holding this way. So in a capitalist society, if we subject the concept of substructure and superstructure to it, it means that the substructure is simply the economic institution where individuals enter into production or productive relations. Somebody is the owner of, of a factory, you have to go and work for him. He defines your salary or wages. He can decide not to give you enough money. He makes so much money. He goes around having the mansions, driving big cars. He says he's a businessman. Meanwhile, must believe that much of the so-called profit he's making is he's still your production, because you produce over and above what you require or what he'll pay you. So he appropriates the rest. So the substructure and the superstructure are important concepts in Mazi sociology. So one is about material production, the other is about ideas. So we'll now go to the next slide. Okay, one, one important thing about the superstructure and the substructure I, I want to explain as well is that, as I was saying, within the superstructure ideas, the substructure has to be consolidated. So Marx believed that 
the superstructure is an ideological apparatus, okay? And it will be constructed in such a way that people or the workers, the wage earners, the proletariat, will not come to see the exploitation in the system, in the economic system. So sometimes the superstructure then serves as an ideological apparatus, justifying exploitation system. But then people will not be made aware of the exploitation system, exploitation the system. If it happens that way, then the workers will be experiencing what it calls false consciousness. They are not conscious about the objective conditions in which they are. That is the work of the superstructure. Ideas must be constructed in society in such a way that the class struggle, the class conflict, the class contradictions are justified. So sometimes some institutions in the superstructure act like drugs. Okay, this is a metaphorical statement. It's like you give a drug to somebody so that the person will be drowsy and doesn't see the reality. So this is what, how the superstructure also relates back to the substructure. Now, Marx's belief was that, just as how Hegel was saying that there's thesis, antithesis, and there'll be synthesis. Marx thinks that the productive systems that have emerged throughout society always create classes of people whose interests are contradictory. So classes of people who clash. So when they clash, they will resolve the conflict, the contradictions. But in the material world, in this case, a new society will be created. So because he lived in the capitalist society and the society is made up of two contending classes, for bourgeoisie and proletariat, when they clash and they fight, the proletariat are in the majority. They will come and destroy the capitalist society. And because they have been exploited for all this while, they will not like people to have private property again. So they will nationalize all the means of production, the lands, the banks, the industries, will now become the property of the state. And so classes will be abolished. And at that stage, we have socialism. So socialism, as I've explained earlier, is the state taking control over all that. Then at the final level, socialism will be transformed into communism. And this is where there will be no human ex exploitation suffering because the system will ask of you to contribute according to your capacity. The system will also give back to you according to your needs. So I want us to move to the next slide now. 